Hello, uh, hope you can see and hear me well. Welcome back to Talk 2021st and to the second plenary session of today. And um, we have now uh, Matteo Vio, who will talk about dark matter and structure form formation. Uh, and after we will hear from Andri Neronov on multi-messenger astronomy. Before leaving the floor to Matteo, I'd like to remind everybody to type your question on in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of the screen, uh, if you want them to be read live. Otherwise, you can ask questions to the speakers in the discussion forum uh, whenever you want. And I will leave the floor to Matteo. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. And thank you to the organizer for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk about dark matter and structure formation. So I'm going to present my personal biased view on this issue. And I'd like to highlight possible interesting, even recent results that to my, in my opinion are very much of interest, especially for this community. So what you see here in the background is a numerical simulation, the so-called Euclid fl flagship simulation that simulates the large scale structure of the universe. And here the size that is simulated is about four gigaparsecs. So it's relatively huge at higher resolution. And so this is the backbone of basically the Euclid pipeline in the, in the sense that here on top of this uh, distribution of uh, uh, filaments and structure, basically the researchers, they paint astrophysical information, they paint galaxies, they paint star formation, they paint systematics, and then they make all this information be digested by a pipeline and try to recover parameters like, let's say, the neutrino mass out of these mock data sets. So it's particularly important in the last years, you know, there have been lots of work in the realization of sophisticated mocks. So uh, this is a view graph that also Licha uh, showed, and thank you, Licha, for the nice uh, introduction. In a way, what I want to, 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 to bring to your attention is the fact that we do have, yes, just one universe, but our universe is dynamic in the sense that we can follow the evolution of cosmic structure from, let's say, the CMB down to redshift zero. And these are very different situations, right? The CMB is described by linear physics. Here we have our nonlinear universe. And basically what shapes the formation of the hierarchical structure formation is gravity, right? And dark matter. And so we can basically look at the hints of dark matter, not only in astrophysical objects, which are, let's say, clusters of galaxies or galaxies or dwarf galaxies, but we can look, even look at dark matter in the perturbations, in the mild perturbation that give rise to the CMB or in the Lyman Alpha Forest or in perturbation at large scales that typically can be described by very different physics, right? Usually simpler. So basically the search for dark matter throughout our universe is a tale of scales and rashes. And I believe that this is particularly true for indirect searches because if we have to convince right, the particle physics community that we do detect dark matter, it's good that the signal will come out from several different observables, possibly different scales, observables that are affected by different systematic effects. And so this is particularly important. Of course, this relatively simple picture, gravity, is perturbed by uh, effects that are more difficult to model, right? For example, astrophysics or gastrophysics, right? Like some people like to, to say, and nonlinearities. And so to, to address these issues, typically uh, another layer of complexity is added and you need more different kind of physical situations. So the, 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 the problem is complex, but we do have a nice starting point, right? We, we do have the CMB, which is a spectacular confirmation of the Lambda CDM model. A six parameter model fits the data incredibly well. And the CMB on its own requires dark matter at the level of 80 sigma. So it's a very astrophysically precise measurements of dark matter abundance. And it's the starting point of all the structure formation processes that we follow in body simulation or even in perturbation theory, right? Let me also tell you that the CMB on its own will provide some constraints on WIMPs, WIMPs dark matter, for example, example, you know, through the annihilation of the WIMPs, you do have injection in the intergalactic medium. This injection will change the ionization history of the universe and will change this parameter tau, which is the least well-measured parameter in the CMB. And of course, is measured particularly well through polarization. And so we do expect that if this bound on tau will improve in the next, uh, let's say, with the next experiments, some limits on the WIMPs can also be improved. 
But for us, the CMB is just a starting point. I will not talk about you know, CMB derived constraints on dark matter. Then the final point is this, our nonlinear universe, what you see here is the distribution of galaxies uh, in let's say the local universe, the DSS galaxies. You can envisage your own statistical tool to interpret this, uh, this network of galaxies, right? So this is our nonlinear universe, as I said, and you need to model very well, basically the relation that, is, that exists between the tracer, sorry, galaxy and colder matter. And this relation can be uh, linear or cannot be linear, but will depend in principle on position, redshift, environment, physics, luminosity, and also instrumental biases, right? And so it's, it's particularly important to model this thing well, this relation well, if you want to infer, if you have to infer fundamental properties of our universe. So we do have a snapshot one initial condition. We have a snapshot, let's say 100, let's redshift zero, let's say, which is our picture of the local universe. The link between the two requires that matter as well, not only the initial condition, but also if you want to describe statistically this distribution of points, uh, which are, could be difficult to model, you, you, you would require that matter. This was pointed out by the Nobel Prize Peebles in a very nice and short paper in 1982. So uh, we have these two with these two snapshots, and uh, uh, we want to let's say have theoretical tools to um, explore these uh, uh, observations. The simplest theory that we have is the so-called press schechter formalism, right? Which has different incarnation, but it's it's a very simple uh, uh, theory, which basically is a linear theory, which gives us a prescription for our nonlinear universe, namely it will basically allow us to measure the number density of dark matter halo, which is this N here as a function of redshift. And what you see here, these curves here, they label basically different objects of different masses, larger than 10 to the 15, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 13, 10 to the seven. And so you see here, for example, one nice thing is that the ratio 15, the number of halos, dark matter halos, whose masses are above 10 to the seven is the same number at ratio zero, right? And this is the hierarchical structure formation, which is captured very well by this figure and by this formalism. Of course, uh, here it is hidden, basically the final layer, the layer which provides the link to the observable, which requires usually the, the modeling of the galaxy dark matter halo connection or some mass proxy. Let's say if you observe some cluster luminosity function or some cluster luminosity, you want to relate this luminosity to the underlying dark matter mass. And this could spoil, right, this, this nice attempt and could insert systematic errors that you need to take into account. But the theory is very simple. You stand from the power spectrum, you filter it out, you define this variable, which is connected to the variance of mass in your field, which is again described by the power spectrum. And you do have a prediction for the universal mass function. You can also have out of this simple equation, a prediction for the bias of these halos, which in terms, in terms can give rise, can give you the input, the, the output of the correlation function of the two point correlation function of the halos. So basically, out of the theory, you have the one point function, the histograms, number of dark matter halos as a function of mass. And you have also the clustering evolution of this throughout the universe, throughout cosmic ages. So it's a very powerful analytical tool that we use as a community, cosmological community to infer fundamental physics. So if the power spectrum, as we will see in a little while, has some features like a suppression of power at small scales for water matter candidates, this of course will be uh, impacted at the level of mass function and at the level of correlation function, right? This is the key, the key point. If the power spectrum changes through fundamental physical arguments, then the mass function will also change and the correlation function will change as well. So far linear theory, but we have to complement this with the nonlinear universe and people have uh, worked intensively in the last few years to develop sophisticated colder matter simulations that simulate the universe at higher, higher and higher resolution. So what you see here in the left part is a zoom in of a recent simulation uh, by Wong et al, in which basically you start from a volume of 150 megaparsec linear size and you go down to sizes that are about 25 parsec or so, in which these you know, uh, lighter filaments are about 3% of the mean density. So it's really the colder matter predictions is really kind of full of structure down to the smallest scales. Colder matter is successful and is also predictive in terms of structure. So what does it predict? It predicts that, this, that we do have numerically 
uh, as an outcome of this n body simulation, a smooth background, Navarro Frank and White halo, which is cusped, which is caspy in the innermost part. So these different colors, they show you the envelope of these results. You see they start to depart in the innermost part because of resolution. But once you increase the resolution, they tend to converge towards either a Navarro Frank and White or an, an Astro profile. Then we do have the bounce abelos with total mass smaller than 10% of the host are predicted. And the most massive, they carry about 1% of the mass. And they are typically much less concentrated than the smooth component. This is, of course, very important. It is to have to seek dark matter throughout, let's say, Fermi observations, right? There are also other predictions. For example, one prediction is you will face in cold dark matter structure formation scenarios, you will face tidal, due to tidal stripping, uh, tidal basically streams that basically are the remnants of, let's say, uh, journeys that satellites make into a typically denser envelope. They will give rise to this tidal stripping phenomenon. And also you will have fundamental streams that are basically uh, produced by cold initial condition and they cost they cause caustics in, in the matter distribution. And typically you follow all of these processes numerically. But I want to show you that in the simple cold dark matter model, we do have predictions that not, not only fulfill the CMB requirements of the large scale structure, but are also kind of relevant and important and can be, let's say, confronted with observation at the smallest scales. So from particle physics, we have a huge, let's say, zoo of particles. And now, especially after, you know, WIMPs has been not found yet, uh, the panorama is quite rich. And the rational underneath, I believe, has to be the one that in which we, we keep searching and we left no stone left unturned. And basically, depending on the candidate that we have, right, sterile neutrinos, uh, even light dark matter in the MEV range, or axions or ultralight axions, the signatures would be radically different. And so we need really to search indirectly and directly at the best of our capabilities with simulations and with theories that are good enough. So there is something, however, appealing, especially for this range here in the KV, in the, in the fact that there, are, there appears to be this nice picture in which lambda cold dark matter fits everything is broken not only at the level of H0 or sigma A tension, as Licha said, but also at the level of small scales. There are some small scale problems, controversies or tensions in which basically we don't fulfill the properties of the simulation. The observation and simulations are at thoughts with each other, right? And this goes under the name of too big to fail, missing satellite problem, CASP and core problems, uh, or let's say even the too low sigma eight you know, is another way of facing this, this kind of tension. But basically it seems that uh, in, in the simulated universe, you can pack up dark matter down to the smallest scales while in the real universe you cannot. And if you take the most massive, let's say, halos in your simulation, the dynamical properties of these most massive halos of the Milky Way, sub halos of the Milky Way, do not correspond to the dynamical properties of the brightest uh, dwarf galaxies of our Milky Way. And this is the too big to fail problem. And basically you can solve it with baryonic physics or maybe a bit more exotically, you can solve it by changing the dark matter paradigm. This is why world dark matter has gained a bit of attention in the last few years. And so, uh, so if we re reason in this way, then we, we want to seek, we want to abandon cold dark matter for a while, we want to go to non cold dark matter models in which basically we will erase small scale structure, right? And by erasing small scale structure, physically you can do this with, by allowing the dark matter to have some thermal velocity. So thereby a kind of genes, um, genes length or a pressure if you wish, right? And this usually cause a drop of power at the smallest scales. This drop of power will depend on the candidate. In this paper here, you, you see what happens for an axion if you don't have such a free streaming or for WIMPs or water matter of a given mass. In this case, I, I bet is a thermal relic. And so in general, these, these kind of models are expected to somewhat ease the tension with these uh, small scale problems of cold dark matter. That's why they are kind of interesting for the community. 
On top of these models, there are other models. For example, here, these are the so-called ethos model in which dark matter is allowed to have interaction with a dark radiation. The dark radiation could also be, let's say, a particle like a fermion or sterile neutrinos, which can be relativistic, and they can interact with each other. And there are two features here. One is a generic drop of power at somewhat this is the ratio of the power spectrum in this cold, non-cold dark matter model with respect to the cold dark matter case. And you, you see you start here to lose, impact, to lose power, to decrease in power. And this is due basically to the dark matter dark radiation interaction. Okay. Uh, and then at small scale, the, 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 the panorama is even richer in the sense that you have, you have these dark acoustic oscillations that are physical. They are not numerical issues. They are due to the fact that gravity is basically acting in a, an opposite way with respect to the, to the pressure of, of radiation. And you typically have this kind of baryonic, baryonic acoustic oscillation, if you want, but at very small scale. This N here is a different way of parameterizing the strength of the interaction between dark matter and dark radiation throughout redshift, right? With the, with the universe temperature or, or, or throughout redshift. The, uh, here I want to make uh, two points. One point is that the small scale are rich in physics, but also the large scales, right? The large scales are typically easier to, to model. You can address them even with perturbation theories, which basically are analytical calculations without embodied simulation. Here, you, will, you are expected to be much more precise in the near future. You can reach error bars possibly at this level of the percent or so. While here, of course, you are more, much more contaminated by astrophysics. So even if here you are more informative in the sense of feature, here the error bars, theoretical error bars, are supposed to be large. So you can also say yourself, OK, I will get rid of these scales. I will start just be interested in this scale only, and I will model at the, best, at the best of my capabilities without embodied simulation, which are, let's say, too complicated. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have resources and things like that. Uh, sorry, let's, let's go on. So in 2017, with uh, a student and, and Alex Merle, we showed that basically most of these non-cold dark matter models, including this dark matter, dark radiation interaction, can be either be you know, fully simulated with the Boltzmann code at the linear level, which follows all the fluid equation numerically, but also this transfer, the so-called transfer function, the ratio of the power spectrum non-cold versus cold, can also be parameterized in this simple way with this alpha, beta, and gamma, which are in a way free parameter in the fit, and you fit them in order to, let's say, fulfill the more complex and exact linear calculation. Once you do this, why do you want to do this? You want to do this because this is going to be the input of your dynamical simulation. You want to be fast in exploring the parameter space. Ideally, you would like also to be less model dependent. You would like to make this alpha, beta, and gamma completely free in a way. Run your structure formation problem, see whether or not it fits the observable with MCMC, and go back. And then ask yourself, OK, I found this alpha, beta, and gamma, which are the physical models that will correspond to this particular choice of the cutoff and its shape, before the cutoff, let's say, uh, place and, 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 and the shape before and after the cutoff. And this is well captured by this alpha, beta, and gamma parameterization that does gain a bit of interest in the literature, has also been improved by other groups in Dharam in other places. So one observable that I'm particularly interested in is the Lyman Alpha Forest. Leach already told you what it is, but it's basically the advantage of the Lyman Alpha Forest that explores the universe down to the small scales. And so ideally, it's, it's one of the best probes of the small scale universe. And basically, as provided in the last years, constraints on thermal water matter, on sterile neutrinos, and also on ultralight boson dark matter, which is the scalar dark matter of fuzzy dark matter, several dark matter candidates, which typically impact the small scales. The bottom line is that from this Lyman Alpha Forest data, there is no convincing case for the dark matter to be warm. Basically, we do provide limits and we do find perfect consistency with the cold dark matter. So the typical, num typical numbers that are advocated to solve this tension at small scales are numbers in the 2 kV for the thermal water matter. But the Lyman Alpha Forest would like numbers that are in the ballpark of larger than 3 kV. So they want cold relics. They don't want warm a warm universe. Otherwise, the thing that is going to happen is that you will fall short at small scales and you start to, let's say, produce less 
structure in your flux power spectrum, which is your observable, right? The flux power spectrum is this quantity here, the observed quantity. These are real data points, and these are two models, one that fits the data, one that does not fit the data. And you see that here you start lacking of power, and it means that you have less substructure. So these, are, these models are, are model dependent, right? They, you, do have, you need to have some, some assumption, uh, and you need to, to basically marginalize over some nuisances. And there is room for improvement. There is room for improvement, especially in modeling the high redshift data and the tail of realization and all the astrophysical effects at the tail of hydrogen realization, which is typically related to patchy realization and complex physics at the level of realization. So these are still somewhat gray area, but we do believe that these effects will not impact the small scale. They have an impact here, but not at the small scales. Anyway, this is an impressive test of the structure formation paradigm. I just added another layer, another snapshot in the thing that I showed before, the snapshot the CMB, the snapshot at redshift zero. This is another snapshot at redshift between two and five. And is a test that validates the structure formation model and in principle could have failed, right? Whether this structure had been astrophysical origin, right? This, 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 this test would have failed. Matteo, so, sorry, you have yes. Yes, 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 yes. We improved this. We used also dark matter dark radiation interactions uh, and, and, and try to constrain also the amount of the interaction, the strength of interaction and the amount of dark radiation. And also this N is basically parameterized the redshift evolution. This is also instrumental in this respect in, with the Julien Lesgur group. Um, with scalar dark matter is again a very simple candidate, mathematically speaking, the physics is very simple, it's the physics of the scalar field in which basically you go after the scalar field and you basically simulate continuity and the Euler equation into an embodied framework. You do have an extra term with respect to the standard case, which is connected to the pressure. And this model is also very interesting because it's very, very predictive. It has lots of a plethora of prediction at the smallest scales, like the presence of cores, the presence of granularity at small scales, which has a given time scale. And this model is very much tested by the community with controversial results. Some people do find cores in dwarfs that claim this model is supported, but some other people do not find cores. Let me skip this. Let me show you something also related to other people's works, which is particularly relevant. This is the group by Simona Vegetti. They look basically at strong, strong gravitational lensing, and they look at the Sabelo population at the lens size. And what do they find here? They find that they, once they model this strong lensing system, they find the per Turber. They find a sabello of a given mass, and not only they can measure the mass, but they can measure the, the slope of density and the projected mass. Again, this perturber is not uh, is not predicted in lambda CDM. Here are the typical perturbers that you find in simulation, and here is what they find. They find, you know, just one model which barely touches this at one the sigma level. This is this contour here is referring to this sabello, and this point here is at one sigma, but it has a very large stellar mass density. It means it should shine, but in reality, it does not shine, does not have stars. So this is a very powerful technique to uh, constrain dark matter properties, right? Because the Sabello population is a mass function. The mass function is uh, impacted by fundamental physical issues. In a paper with uh, other people, we try to provide to put all this in the same pot, right? Gravitational images, which is this technique, stellar streams, dwarf spheroid, the Lyman Alpha, Milky Way satellite. We got down to a number which is particularly interesting. We find a lower limit of 6 kV, which is very interesting, interesting, which is dominated not by the Lyman Alpha, but the Milky Way satellites. You simply count the dark matter sabellos in your Milky Way. So another issue is uh, cool dark matter produced radiation. We, we know that this is the case. You can have decay, you can have annihilation. The decay will be proportional to the mass, the annihilation to the mass square. And this is a recent finding uh, by uh, a group basically of Simon White at the Max Planck, in which basically they uh, review uh, the properties of the Milky Way in its sabellos with sophisticated dark matter simulations. So this exercise was done also 13 years ago, but the results now are a bit different. 13 years ago, the importance of Sabellos in our Milky Way were, were, were much larger than now. Now, the, 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 the simulation of the gamma ray flux density, let's say, is this for the Milky Way. And you see it's totally dominated by a round halo, which is the Milky Way halo, rather than by, by Sabello. 
If you have dark matter only simulation, you do have a more, let's say, prominent sabello population coming out of the picture. This, of course, has important consequences for direct searches like the Fermi excess or whether you want to integrate on top of dwarf galaxies to get out the WIMP dark matter signal, right? So what did, did change in 13 years? The thing that changed is basically a more refined treatment of baryonic physics. And the baryonic physics here is followed much better. And now this gives rise to a much rounder, shallower, let's say a much rounder in, in shape and stronger impact of the Milky Way halo compared to, 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 to the Sabella population. Let me conclude. I believe that you know, uh, we need to tackle the dark matter problem by addressing large medium scales. At large scales, we can look at the interaction with baryons and radiations of the dark matter component. We can look at the weak lines in observable as Euclid will do. We also can look at galaxy clustering as Euclid, Daisy will do, right? But also there is the small scale, uh, very small scale picture in which then there we will be addressing things a bit more, let's say fine structure in, a way, in the sense that we look at the phase density. We can look at self-interacting matter. We can look at this gravitational imaging with the strong lens in the, in the substructure. We can look at the mass function. We can look really at streams and gaps in strong lensing arcs. And I believe that this is gonna be full of surprise in the next coming year. So I'll finish here so I, give, I can give uh, some time for questions if there are any. Thank you. Thanks, Matteo, for the very nice talk. And uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. If folks want to type their questions here in the Q&A box or in the Zoom chat, I'll be happy to read some of them. Otherwise, you're welcome to ask questions directly in the discussion forum to uh, to the speakers and and they will reply lively. Um, I have a um, question in the meantime while uh, mm -hmm. people warm up. Um, you show that there are several models that can produce a cutoff in the matter power spectrum like warm dark matter axions or uh, interacting dark matter. I wonder if uh, by combining different observations, uh, one is able to disentangle the different models. So suppose you want to uh, observe this suppression. Is there a way to yeah. pick up that's, your preferred model? That's an excellent question. So indeed, for example, let's talk about first the thing that I'm working on. With the Lyman Alpha Forest, there is a bit of sensitivity to the shape and not only the cutoff. So the shape, for example, in, let's say, axion dark matter like ultralight axion is a bit steeper than the shape in, let's say, thermal world dark matter. Or, and is even different from, of course, from the shape of interactive dark matter. So we do have this constraining power. But then there are also future observables. I prepare an extra slide because I believe this, this question was very interesting. There is a, a group by Munoz and Vorkin, people working on this thing in which they ask themselves, okay, suppose we want to disentangle between, let's say, a model like ETHOS, like this one, which has, has a, a suppression of power and that has this oscillation with a model in which there is water matter, in which with the water matter basically fit the envelope of this oscillation. Will you be able to do so? And the answer is yes, with 21 centimeter, you are able to disentangle between the two provided, provided of course you get rid of let's say foregrounds. And in this case, you really address the very linear universe threshold between 10 and 30. So it's kind of futuristic, but the chi square that I quite had quoted here, these are really the chi square that corresponds between the difference between two models that are very similar in terms of power spectrum, right? And you, by using 21 centimeter observable at such high ratio at such small scales, then you are really able to exploit the difference in, this, in, this, in these models. And these are scales are not addressed by the Lyman alpha, which is down here. So you need somewhat smaller scales. Thanks, Matteo. Uh, in the meantime, we have two questions, one from Jinan Zhang, I hope I pronounce it well. Uh, will the precision measurement of gravity wave provide any constraint on dark matter searches? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. One thing that we'd explore a bit is given this interest in black, black holes and, and even primordial black holes is whether you know primordial black holes models can, let's say, um, <clears throat> disentangle between 
um, can, can, can be the dark matter, I have said this. And so we kind of simulated primordial black holes in structure formation and we put some limit on the fraction of primordial black holes and the possible mass. What, this is one thing, given their interest in black holes, triggered also by the gravitational wave observation. Other things uh, uh, I have to think about it, but we haven't, we haven't explored much this, this, this issue, but it might be of interest, yes. Thanks. And one final question by Nicolao. I apologize with uh, Elena and I encourage her to write the question in the discussion forum, but we only have time for one last question. Uh, what could be the relevance of voids and void statistics for dark matter studies? Well, well, uh, voids, void, that's a good question. Void is another topological study of the large scale structure, right? So it's, it's, pretty, it's, pretty ex, it's pretty natural that in a scenario in which you change the topology of dark matter, the voids population would be different. But the point is that, so on one side, you want to go down to the smaller scales, right? But on the other side, there are some statistics that are more related to the topology that are very much sensitive to their matter nature. For example, if I have to ask yourself, what is the median density of the universe? And not say the mean density, I say the median density, the median density will radically change in warmer matter or colder matter, it will be very much different. But the point is that how can I measure this median density? Well, voids can help, right? It's another, you know, last case structure observable that can help you reconstruct the topology and then maybe can, you can estimate this. Voids estimating world of matter universe have not been done much, uh, but it might be of interest. Yes, I agree. Small scale voids and look at the void population in let's say, or voids in voids, things like this could be of interest, yes. Thanks, Matteo, and thanks for uh, your very nice talk. Uh, and now I will leave the floor to, um, sorry, uh, um, to Andrin Aronoff uh, and from APC Paris and University of Geneva. And Andrew will talk about multi-messenger astronomy. And for all folks with questions for Matteo, please write them in the discussion forum. Thanks. Okay. I hope you see my screen now. Yes. Well, uh, so I will try to review a little bit uh, the field of uh, multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, it's a bit, uh, uh, well, quite a change of subject uh, to compare to the previous talks of today, but well, there is cosmology part certainly on it. That's not the part uh, past uh, that I will follow. Uh, well, I will try to rather uh, summarize information uh, on what uh, did we learn about uh, different types of astronomical signals over the last, uh, let's say decade, uh, there was a rapid development of the field. Uh, recently, which is uh, maybe well represented by this diagram, I tried to put uh, all uh, the uh, types of astronomical messengers, uh, which we use nowadays, electromagnetic, neutrino, gravitational waves, cosmic rays, on the energy of frequency axis. So, well, it stretches over, uh, well, many decades uh, uh, in energy and frequency. And then, uh, well, we are able to more or less see sources, do some spectroscopy, do some timing studies on these sources using all this uh, variety of uh, techniques. Uh, so, well, that's, uh, we start to call uh, some observation technique uh, astronomy as soon as we can do images. You see, intentionally, I didn't include uh, cosmic rays starting from giga electron volt energy, because we are sort of missing imaging. We can do imaging at 10 to the 20 electron volt. Then uh, we ascribe that part of cosmic ray physics to astronomy. That's a little bit arbitrary division, but as I understand this is the sort of, uh, well, the convention for now. So as soon as we are able to do imaging, spectroscopy and timing, we can start asking questions about uh, astronomical sources we can look at isolated sources, we can study source populations or diffuse background, and occasionally, maybe surprising, uh, looking through all these decades in energy and frequency, 
there are some common sources, common topics for study. Cosmology certainly is one of that uh, topics. Indirect searches of dark matter is another. I would rather concentrate on a couple of other topics uh, about uh, high energy activity of astronomical sources, let's say cosmic particle colliders topics, topic, and uh, some physics of transient astronomical sources. That's very uh, uh, lively subject uh, in uh, this domain of astronomy. So that's a vast field and well, I need to choose my path uh, for uh, presentation. So I will just go from left to right. That's the simplest uh, way. And if I start from, uh, yeah, there's just to mention that there are these 43 decades in energy and frequency. So if I start from the left, uh, maybe the first uh, uh, milestone uh, on this uh, x-axis is uh, the nanohertz uh, frequency range where apparently, or maybe we are starting to see astronomical signals. This happened, uh, well, first reports happened uh, just this year. So it's a fresh topic. And uh, the facilities in question are uh, pulsar time in arrays. Uh, we are trying to detect gravitational waves uh, of very long wavelengths, very low frequency using precision timing of signals from uh, mostly millisecond pulsars. And then uh, the idea is that, uh, let's say change of the distance to the pulsar would affect uh, timing pattern of the pulsar. And if there is a gravitational wave passing uh, through this sort of uh, well, network of line, lines of sight to the pulsars, there will be some coherent deformations of the timing pattern in different pulsars. So that's the idea. And uh, well, basically we are able to uh, probe the frequency range, uh, which is, uh, well, the lowest frequency that can be probed is determined just by the duration of the timing uh, uh, data. And nowadays it's about uh, 10 or 15 years for different pulsar timing arrays. And then if we just look at the simple formula from Newtonian gravity, this is the formula which determines the period of rotation of the Earth around the sun. So with a little bit of rescaling, we understand that here we are sensitive, for example, for gravitational waves emitted by binary supermassive black holes, which we expect uh, should be there because we know how the galaxies were assembled from small to larger. So in the same way, if every galaxy hosts a supermassive black holes, the supermassive black holes uh, should come together. They sort of fall in the centers of the galaxy and are expected to merge, coalesce to form uh, larger black holes. So then uh, uh, with this pulsar time in arrays, we see uh, this process taking place. So we would see uh, steady state sources uh, when these black holes are still far from merger. At the moment when they would reach merger uh, state, uh, uh, they would uh, shine gravitational waves rather at millihertz frequency. So this would be observable with space-based interferometers like LISA. Now, uh, something happened uh, just uh, over the last year in this domain. Uh, up to now, uh, pulsar time in arrays like this nanograph, uh, Parkes uh, pul pulsar time in array, there is also European pulsar time in array, uh, have been reporting upper limits on the gravitational wave background, not uh, on individual sources, but on collective uh, uh, flux from uh, uh, all the uh, population of supermassive black holes. But uh, just this year, there was first report by Nanograph Collaboration, which uh, reported that uh, they observed some common stochastic process in different pulsars, which is consistent uh, with uh, gravitational wave background. They didn't, do not claim detection because they are missing some key, el key element. Uh, they are missing some predicted angular uh, correlations between uh, uh, signals in different lines of sight uh, represented in this plot uh, uh, here on uh, in the center on the bottom. So there is uh, the precision is not yet there. Then uh, uh, this was uh, scrutinized by uh, uh, PPTA paper, which appeared just in July. 
uh, and they more or less confirm uh, nanograph measurement. They tell if we repeat uh, the analysis uh, of nanograph, we get uh, the result which is consistent. Although there is a warning again that uh, we do not observe this uh, angular uh, pattern, correlation pattern. And then uh, there are, uh, well, some strong model assumptions adopted in the analysis on the properties of the timing noise of different pulsars. So uh, some unaccounted systematics uh, can, uh, of course, mimic uh, the signal. So uh, the, the result needs to be scrutinized further. But uh, taken at face value, the result is consistent with uh, sort of, uh, well, out of the first principle calculation of what should be the properties of the signal. This is represented by this vertical uh, dashed line in the right plot. This is the uh, slope of, uh, well, the, the gravitational wave background should be power low in frequency and the slope of this power low is predicted uh, by basic physics uh, of uh, binary mergers. And the data seem to be consistent with this basic physics. Uh, just to tell that, uh, of course, uh, well, uh, there are perhaps alternative models and especially as soon as this uh, nanograph result uh, got published there, were further publications that provide uh, interpretation which is also consistent with the data. For example, uh, if we go to, uh, well, th this nanograph, uh, nanohertz frequency range uh, is a good frequency range for gravitational wave produced, for example, in cosmological settings at uh, the first order QCD phase transition. If we calculate the size of cosmological horizon at QCD phase transition, convert it into frequency uh, of gravitational waves, we will get more or less in the nanohertz range. So uh, that's a viable interpretation also. Uh, one should tell it, it should be difficult to distinguish uh, these two types of signals because uh, apart from, uh, well, having a similar frequency range, they also are expected to maybe have similar uh, slope uh, as well, suggested by some models. For example, this figure here shows uh, the background from uh, turbulence, MHD turbulence at QCD phase transition. So. Of course, improvement of the data quality is uh, needed. Uh, maybe in the, in the case of QCD phase transition, what would expect uh, to see a break in the power spectrum, uh, more or less in the nanohertz uh, range. Of course, the direct way to test uh, the binary black hole uh, origin of this background would be to test uh, to detect individual sources. This should be possible with the uh, next generation or upgrades of facilities, uh, maybe several sources should be detectable. Uh, like uh, there are some candidate uh, binary supermassive black holes uh, uh, detected in active galactic nuclei. One most uh, known example is this OG 287. Uh, there is uh, possibly also uh, 3C66B. So those sources will be above uh, the detectability limit or sensitivity limit of uh, the upgraded facilities. And uh, well, we should gradually start to see the sources. This is actually already perhaps happening uh, as soon as this uh, 3C66B uh, radio galaxy was uh, claimed to be a binary black hole. There was a, a follow-up publication which constrained uh, the gravitational wave signal from uh, this uh, galaxy using the data of the time. So this is definitely a developing story. Now, well, this is also an illustration of multi-messenger nature of already the detection technique, which uses uh, radio signal from pulsars uh, to detect gravitational waves, but also to see candidate sources. Uh, we rely on information uh, from uh, radio and optical uh, uh, telescopes on uh, periodicity of the sources. Now, if I move to the right in this plot, uh, I uh, uh, fall into the uh, frequency range of kilohertz gravitational waves. Uh, this here we are dealing with uh, ground-based interferometers. Uh, they are sensitive uh, to the gravitational waves in a different uh, frequency range. 
and uh, correspondingly we are sensitive to the uh, signal produced by stellar mass black holes uh, and neutron stars. One important development that happened in this field is the addition, well up to now there were three facilities uh, uh, doing this and now uh, there is force uh, detector added. This is Kagra interferometer in Japan. So this will improve uh, localization of uh, gravitational wave sources on the sky. Now, uh, there is a little bit parallel story with the nanohertz uh, uh, frequency range and LISA, but this time it is inverted. This time LISA will be able to see uh, let's say steady state emission from pre-merger binary systems while ground-based interferometers are uh, looking at the merger events themselves. So this field uh, is developing since already several years. Uh, there were three runs of LIGO Virgo uh, detectors. They detected the whole populations of merger in, merging black hole uh, binaries, neutron star, uh, black hole binaries and uh, neutron star, neutron star uh, binaries. Uh, well, I will just scroll uh, through those who have or would have uh, uh, multi-messenger counterparts. This is maybe not the case for black hole, black hole mergers, just because there is no matter to shine in electromagnetic, uh, to produce electromagnetic radiation. But potentially black hole neutron star and neutron star, neutron star mergers should uh, produce electromagnetic flux. But on occasion, there were two black hole neutron star mergers detected in uh, the data, and they are both not uh, good for, electromag for possessing electromagnetic counterpart. Uh, the uh, qualitative argument here is like this to, let's say, when the neutron star uh, approaches the black hole, it can either plunge under the horizon or be tidally disrupted and produce accretion disk. It is in the case when it produces accretion disk, uh, it would produce uh, microquasar-like activity with electromagnetic counterpart. We can uh, see if this is the case. Uh, if we uh, calculate, so to tidally disrupt something, we need that the, uh, the condition that the gradient of uh, gravitational potential across uh, the object should be larger than the gravitational potential created by the object itself. On occasion, this was not the case for the two events. The mass uh, ratio uh, was too high for this. Uh, and then, well, there, there is still some useful uh, uh, measurements done from the two detections, like we can estimate now the merger rate, uh, volume merger rate of uh, this sort of uh, objects. Now, where we do detect electromagnetic counterparties in the neutron star, neutron star mergers, uh, there is one famous uh, event when uh, uh, the, the counterpart was detected in gamma rays and then uh, in x-rays uh, visible light uh, down to the radio. There is now another object of this type. Uh, it's uh, a little bit unfortunate. It was four times further distance. So if we just look at uh, the plot which we see for the famous event uh, GW170817, we see that if we divide by statistics of uh, the signal for this event by uh, respectively factor of 16 uh, for gamma rays, uh, the, uh, the signal would be diluted uh, in the noise. So no chance to see, to localize uh, the event on the sky and then to follow up with uh, uh, multi-wavelength campaigns. So still, we have more reliable estimate of the merger rate from two event uh, pop source population compared to one event. For the uh, GW170817, uh, that's, uh, well, the, the physics is rich, uh, the reports, uh, well, the, there is an enormous number of publications. And in fact, the object is still there on the sky three or four years after the merger event. So we have learned from this event that uh, the neutron star mergers do indeed produce gamma ray, uh, short gamma ray burst uh, events. That was an important benchmark. We were able to measure the properties of, of the afterglow. We were able to uh, 
see uh, the details of the kilo nova physics with it. And apparently now there is a new piece of physics which emerges uh, with uh, this event uh, in X-rays, in, in X-ray afterglow, uh, there is a new component emergent which can be the accretion disk on the black hole or emission from the kilo nova injector, ejector uh, hitting uh, the interstellar medium. So the story is uh, developing. Now, go into this story of multi-messenger uh, detection. Uh, well, this was a transient source on the sky and it uh, sort of, well, its detection technique follows the generic pattern of uh, physics of uh, multi-messenger transient. There are various populations appearing in various detection channels. So just to mention, well, the story of short gamma ray bursts, uh, uh, there are two alternative models uh, of short gamma ray bursts with this kilonova detection, uh, well, neutron star, neutron star merger detection. We got confirmation that this uh, uh, short gamma ray burst can, can be produced through this channel. Although the short gamma ray burst associated to uh, the kilonova was uh, sort of uh, three orders of magnitude weaker than conventional uh, short gamma ray bursts. So, uh, we, we need more sources to, to learn about this. Uh, there is another model for short gamma ray bursts uh, uh, produced by soft gamma repeaters, magnetars uh, residing perhaps in different galaxies around us. Uh, I'm showing here a, a, a plot from a paper of 2005, which also claimed that uh, soft gamma repeaters can explain significant fraction of uh, short gamma ray bursts. This is also a developing story. Uh, well, we, we can add a multi-messenger uh, part to this story now. Well, this is an example of, of publication of uh, this year already. There was a short gamma ray burst with spectral properties which uh, resembled uh, uh, soft gamma repeater. So there is now a direct confirmation that this was not a merger of neutron stars because Kagra detector was uh, operational at the time at, at this distance, it would certainly produce, uh, detect neutron star merger. So there are uh, useful things that we learn with every new detection, of course. Moving I'm to- sorry, Five minutes left. Okay, so moving to the next type of uh, transients, or maybe I will shorten this transient story. Uh, yes, so uh, there is now also emerging relation between soft gamma repeaters, those which produce uh, short gamma ray bursts and fast radio bursts. There is now one coincident detection. So uh, the technique is definitely developing. And uh, well, maybe uh, I will move a little bit faster, yes. So. To, to, to finish with this uh, uh, populations of transient sources, maybe go into the population of long gamma ray bursts. We know since a while that uh, those long gamma ray bursts are perhaps produced by a special type of supernova. We would expect to see gravitational wave signal from those bursts, but not with the present day detectors, unless uh, the, uh, superno uh, the core collapse happens in our uh, galaxy. But then this, of course, uh, supernova, multi-messenger sources uh, uh, in all senses, because they produce neutrinos, uh, electromagnetic emission from gamma rays to, from radio to gamma rays. And uh, well, they will sooner or later be detected as gravitational wave sources. Uh, Yes, I wanted to move a little bit to the high energy part of uh, multi-messenger astronomy. Through this uh, story of long gamma ray bursts, uh, there is an ongoing uh, 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 development of the story of the highest energy end of the gamma ray burst spectra. Starting from a couple of years, uh, this uh, afterglows of gamma ray bursts started to be detected in the TV energy range. And this is a bit uh, challenging for the modeling of uh, those gamma ray bursts because uh, the default uh, interaction uh, uh, mecha uh, emission mechanism, which is inverse Compton emission, does not seem to work well because the observed spectra are too hard for this. And uh, here the inverse Compton scattering happens in the Klein Nishina regime. So, uh, for example, modeling of uh, one of the gamma ray bursts by Hess, uh, uh, detected by Hess telescope. 
uh, well, the, the, the paper concluded that uh, perhaps the best uh, possibility would be if the synchrotron spectrum of the afterglow extends all the way up to TV band. But this is a little bit, uh, well, not a little bit, this is challenging the conventional model of how electrons can be accelerated uh, in the afterglow uh, in, on the shock. Uh, so there, there, is, there should be some process which injects PV electrons in the uh, gamma ray burst outflow. It's not clear what is it. Well, fortunately, since uh, some time, uh, maybe in a sense since uh, this year as well, we have some ways to detect uh, PV signals directly uh, using either electromagnetic channel or neutrino channel. In the neutrino channel, uh, the, the uh, astrophysical neutrino flux has been reported by IceCube uh, back in 2013. Its origin is unknown. Its properties are indicating that uh, it is maybe of extragalactic origin, but the searches of sources up to were uh, not uh, quite convincing up to now. The detections are, let's say, at most three sigma level, but maybe we are starting to get a handle on the uh, population of uh, neutrino sources. Maybe just to make a comment here that uh, well, there should be basically two parts of the astrophysical neutrino flux, one from the galaxy, one from outside of the galaxy, maybe an indication for the existence of galactic component of neutrino flux is in a simple comparison of the all sky gamma ray spectrum and neutrino spectrum. Occasionally, they have consistent uh, normalization and slope, one can even fit uh, the two with single power law. So maybe well this is indicative of possible presence of galactic component but uh, anisotropy of uh, ice cube flux does not really uh, show uh, the well some excess in the direction of the galaxy well we need to understand how the imaging properties of uh, diffuse all sky emission change across energy ranges it would be nice to have gamma ray measurements right in the energy range of uh, neutrino flux and gradually we are starting to get there just this year there were series of publications by new observational facilities tibet uh, experiment has added muon detector to uh, uh, their electromagnetic uh, air shower array. Uh, in this way, they were able to detect diffuse emission from the, to, to separate gamma rays from background cosmic rays, charged cosmic rays, and to detect diffuse emission from the galaxy up to the PEV energy range. There is also a LASSO experiment, which starts operation now. It also has very good separation power of gamma rays from background cosmic rays. It was also able to detect uh, PV sources on the sky now individual sources. So making sense uh, out of this detection, uh, well, this uh, perhaps the plot on the bottom left illustrates that uh, uh, last uh, uh, Tibet detection of diffuse flux constrains uh, already possible uh, galactic component of the signal maybe some models of uh, this uh, galactic component are shown by various lines, but still there is a, a space for this. And then of course there should be uh, uh, emission from isolated sources. Uh, maybe I will skip this. Uh, so I don't have time left, right? So maybe- One or two minutes more. Okay, so just, uh, uh, well, the maybe easiest part of the talk is about ultra high energy cosmic ray, multi messenger astronomy, which is not yet there. Uh, maybe let me com make some comments uh, on this. So it is a long uh, story that uh, we can do astronomy with ultra high energy cosmic rays, even though they uh, are made of uh, protons and nuclei, which are charged particles. But uh, the energies of those charged particles are so high that, uh, let's say, protons would be deflected just by one degree by galactic magnetic field. So since uh, maybe 50 years already, people have this idea that if we uh, collect large enough sample of ultra high energy cosmic rays, we will be able to see sources on the sky. This motivates develop development of technology. So up to now, 
we did not see isolated sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays. At least we were not able to see clustering of uh, ultra high energy cosmic ray, ray, uh, ray arrival directions on degree scale. So instead, uh, while well, current generation experiments have detected dipole anisotropy and have evidence for intermediate scale anisotropy on 20 degree scale, uh, maybe there is physical reason for uh, why do cosmic rays do not prefer uh, one degree scale, prefer larger scale for clustering. Uh, the answer may be in the composition of cosmic ray flux. Uh, the most recent analysis of Pierre Auger Observatory suggests that the highest energy part of the cosmic ray flux is perhaps uh, made of a mix of moderately heavy atomic nuclei. So if protons are deflected by one degree, uh, nuclei with charge uh, 234 would be de deflected by uh, 234 degrees on the sky. So, uh, but, uh, well, if this is so, uh, it is, of course, more challenging to detect uh, those larger scale clustered, uh, uh, larger scale clusters on the sky. And uh, while well, the analysis start to strongly depend on uh, our knowledge or ignorance of uh, the structure of galactic magnetic fields. So uh, the, the story becomes more complicated and it would take certainly more time for a real start of ultra high energy cosmic ray astronomy. But current arrays, uh, current experiments are upgrading. There are ideas for the next generation developments to collect larger statistics. So sooner or later, uh, we will be also there. So more or less, well, I, uh, well, that's my summary slide, which is sort of identical to the uh, initial slide. I hope uh, I, I was able to build some logic from uh, the left to the right, from the smallest frequencies to the largest energies. Uh, relating always through some type of sources which are observed in different channels with in, in gradually increasing energy band, uh, energy range. Okay, so that, that's all. Thanks, Andre, for this very comprehensive picture of uh, multi-messenger astronomy. I'm sure there will be plenty of questions and unfortunately, I think we can uh, grab just one minute for one very short question, if any. Please type your question in the chat if you want. Otherwise, there is the discussion forum open for, for questions. Okay, I don't see quick questions. So I encourage people to write in the discussion forum and ensure that there will be plenty of questions for Andre. And I'm sorry, but we have to leave the floor to the discussion panels and they will be accessed uh, via the links that you find in uh, Aula Virtual and the discussion panels will happen in Blackboard Collaborate. And thanks everybody for attending this plenary session. Thanks to the speakers, to Matteo and Andre for their very nice talks and uh, see you all in the discussion panels. Bye-bye.